Georgia Fortunato. I'm Bethany. I'm Kristen. I'm Tracy. I'm Rita. I'm Miriam. I'm Carrie. I'm Ian. I am Lisa. Kim Hamilton. And Laura Hirsch. Megan Graham. Grace Diaz. Lee Gaspar. Shilton Knight. Zalda Collins. Donna Precon. Amanda Simino. Mary Reynolds. Sue Turcotte. Friend of Horror God. This is my partner. Kristen Michelena. Jennifer Becchio. I am Maria Shalcross Smith. And I am Amy Shalcross Vogel. And we're mother and daughter in business. I am a woman. Hear me roar. In numbers too big to ignore. Hello there. And welcome to Women's Business. My name is Dr. Miriam Shalcross Smith, known to most as Dr. Daycare. I will be like to welcome you to my mentoring program designed to educating our community on issues facing working women. We'll be speaking to our guests in the area of arts, sciences, education, law, medicine, politics, and of course, women's business. The goal of women's business is to provide information that comes only from personal experience, pass this information down to our own daughters, nieces, neighbors, family, and friends. Much of the content will relate to the guest speaker's journey in their chosen profession, what they learned about the process, and certainly what they wish they knew before they began their journey into women's business. Since women-owned business are the fastest growing sector in our economy, our guest will close with a lesson learned that she would like to pass on to our listening audience. And I would like to thank the listening audience for listening in to Women's Business. Today is my guest is Amy Davidson. Hi, Mary. Hi, Amy. We know each other from all kinds of networking out there in the communities. This is kind of like a situation. We're just going to hone in on Rosie's Girls, which is just every time you say Rosie's Girls or Radio Rosie, you just bloom. You totally <laughs> just bloom. And I'm going to get to know so much more about it today. So tell me about Rosie's Girls. Um, well, Rosie's Girls is a program that was actually started in Vermont by the Vermont Works for Women. And oh, wow. it's aimed at getting young girls involved in vocational trades that have traditionally been closed to women and girls. So welding, woodworking, carpentry, construction trades, auto mechanics, um, electricians work. Uh, the list goes on and on into public service as well, police work, firefighters, um, military, things of that nature. So the aim of the program is to engage girls um, in as many of these skills as possible to get them swinging hammers and using screwdrivers and power tools and also connecting them with women who work in these fields um, so that they can learn what it takes to, uh, to, to have these careers. You know, as you say that, something pops up in my head. My uh, brother-in-law, his daughters are now 40, and the youngest will be 38, 37, I think, on uh, May 7th. And he was a plumber. He became a plumber when he was a young, he married my sister many, many, many years ago, and 40-some um, years ago at the time. Um, and he had two daughters, and he was a plumber. And on the side of his truck, he has R.G. Clegg and daughters. And when he wrote that, when they were little girls, I'm like, oh, my goodness, whoever sees that, it's usually mm -hmm. R.G. Clegg and sons. Right. And my goodness, to that day, it's like I haven't seen another, another V and it goes by that says the and daughters. And as you say that, I'm like, this is so needed. It's very empowering Whoa, for it's girls. It's very empowering. It's you know? very empowering to see themselves in positions that they aren't generally shown in. Shown in. Um, whether it's in the media or just in general, you know, you pass by a construction site on the street and the only woman you see is generally, you know, she's holding a stop sign. Not that that's not an important role, <laughs> but she's just as capable of holding a jackhammer or using uh, some of the heavy equipment um, as the men are, but a lot of girls don't ever see themselves in that position. They don't see themselves portrayed that way, and they're not offered opportunities to move in that direction. So Rosie's Girls is a program to offer them as many of those opportunities as possible. So I'm, I'm just asking questions off the top of my head. Is it because they haven't seen themselves in those roles or because we, they haven't been given the opportunity? Do you think there's a fight to get into those roles to get the girl with the hammer? Yes, absolutely. There's, um, okay. you know, as we move into the 21st century, there's going to be a lot of jobs opening up in these fields. Um, I was reading recently about a huge number of jobs in welding that are going to be opening up welding. in the next 10 to 20 years as... Um, you know, aging welders start to retire, and there's a gap in education. There's not a lot of pe there's right now. There's not enough people to fill those jobs that'll be open in the next 10 to 20 years. And a contributing factor of that is for generations, we've directed boys towards the vocations, and we've directed we girls have. towards other avenues. And a lot of girls don't know that vocational high school is an option for them. They don't ever think about welding as a viable trade for them to learn, when it's actually a really great 
steady, secure job. It pays well. The skills um, are Very applicable anywhere in the country, around the world you could get a job. Um, so we like to introduce girls, you know, get them thinking about this is a viable option for you. You can be a teacher, you can be a nurse, you can also be a welder, you can also I be a firefighter. It. I love that, firefighter. So how do we get our daughters, granddaughters, nieces, neighbors, how do we get them involved in this? How do you do this? Um, at Rosie's Girls, we kind of have a two-pronged method. We get the tools in their hands okay. and we get so them working the on projects. The they okay, put the hammer in the it. hand, we give them toolboxes, they take them home. Really? Um, at the end of the summer, yeah, that's always a big you know, prize to go home at the end of the summer with your toolbox and you know all the tools that are in it and how they work. Cool. Um, and we get them working on projects. So, you know, we give them the tools and it's not just for show. It's like, this is your hammer. You're going to be using your hammer to build your spice rack or your bench or your, you know, with the hinged lid. Um, you're going to be using your measuring tape. You're going to be using the power saw to cut your own wood. Um, so that's one major aspect of the approach is that we give the girls hands-on experience. And another aspect, the sort of other prong of our um, the way that we go about this is giving them mentors. Okay. So we bring in women who work in these fields that we want these girls to think about as possibilities for themselves um, to talk about their experience as women in those fields, there are challenges that women face specific to being women. I know I don't have to tell you um, in male dominated fields. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's it's really we have a lot of guest speakers come in. We have a lot of trade instructors come in and just share their experience and their skills with our girls, whether it's over the course of the six weeks or just for one day. You know, I'm going to tell you, I never even thought <clears throat> of and I have two beautiful granddaughters. I never even thought I'd talk to my one and only daughter say to be a welder. I need to tell you, it was like doctor, lawyer, businesswoman. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Definitely not a nurse. I just, no, no. I, I didn't bring that into my vocabulary back then because I just felt there was a lot of nurses. But I would have never thought welder or plumber. And here's my brother-in-law, my former brother-in-law, with, you know, with and daughters. And so it's uh, going to be generational gap Absolutely. here, right? Am I, yeah. A lot of these girls go and home. I can't see me talking to my granddaughters about being a welder. It's true. It's a lot amazing. of these girls go home and their parents, you know, are surprised by the skills that they've learned over the course of the six weeks. They are really moved to see these projects that the girls have worked on um, and they bring home with them. Um, they're impressed by the work that they do. I had one camper last year who came to me so proud in the sixth week of camp and she's like, my dad and my uncle are working on the, our bathroom at home. They're redoing the whole bathroom, and I asked them if I could help, and I asked them if I could help, and they kept saying no. And so I just started naming the tools that they were using in the toolbox, there and they go. finally said that I could help. And it's, it's true that there is, you know, it's very important to empower children and to tell them all of these options are open to you, but it's equally important to let their parents and their family know that, yes, your daughter can be a doctor, your daughter can be a businesswoman, your daughter can be a CEO, but she can also own her own contracting business. Yeah, she can so also cool. wield a torch and be a welder. Amazing. All of these things are open to everyone. It's not gender-specific work. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Now, are you finding it with the Rosie's girls, are you finding it hard to... to um to get these girls to come in the program? Do you have enough of these girls? Do you have a waiting list of these girls? How do they get involved, you know? Um, do you have to do a lot of recruiting? We do a lot of recruiting. We try to start recruiting as early as possible. Um, we we like to get at least 30 girls in our program. Oh, that's fabulous. It is, yeah, 30 is a good number. We have a six-week program, so it can be difficult to retain our girls over the six weeks of the summer, because six weeks is a significant chunk of the summer. So it we is. try and um, have as much variety across the six weeks as possible to keep the girls coming back. So. Mm. We have, you know, the constant through line of our construction and carpentry trade um, instruction, but we also take field trips. We have guest speakers come. We do special activities. Um, we have service learning projects that we work in across the six weeks to try and keep our girls coming back and coming back. And we do have a pretty high retention rate. You know, we get about 30 girls in our summer. We recruit from area schools. Um, we operate out of a local... Um, private girls school the Sophia Academy I love Sophia Academy I actually Avenue. many many years ago I'd say a good 10 years ago I was a mentor for them for a, a young woman and I had a blast really I learned a lot from that woman that young girl you know mm -hmm. um, I used to go weekly to meet with her way back when and it was a, I got to know um, the whole system of Sophia and they're dedicated they're, they're very, very dedicated, dedicated to their girls they are, they are dedicated to their girls mm -hmm. good way of putting it their high priority was their students. You Absolutely. felt it when you walked in the door. You it's did. true. And they're a small enough program that they can really give their girls a lot of individual attention mm -hmm. and empowerment. Mm -hmm. And we recruit heavily from Sophia Academy because our program runs on their site. 
So we want to give their girls an opportunity to participate in our program, you know, in a space that's familiar to them. Um, and we also, uh, we just kind of cast a wide net around Providence to get as many, about 11 to 14 year old girls involved okay, in our so program as we can. Ask the age yeah, so middle school. Up to 14, middle school, which is a great age to begin. It's a challenging age. Yeah, they, <laughs> they have a different agenda. They do, yeah. So I put a hammer on their hand, and I'm um, sure it's like, okay, what can I do with this? They're very open to many different ideas, I'm sure. Absolutely. Now, at the end of the summer, the end of six weeks, do they, they like, like, do they build a boat or something, or is it mostly just getting the getting to know the um, the tech? the whole thing on vocation. Um, moving forward, we'd like to have a larger project like that as part of Rosie's Girls. Uh, currently, we have them working on smaller projects. So each week they have a carpentry project that nice. they work on. Yep. So they all have their own individual projects. However, there is uh, a service learning element that is a, a sort of a bigger picture yeah. aspect. And we try and do the change and charity aspects of service learning. So charity is sort of like when you go out and you provide meals for people who are hungry. Wow. And change is where you go out and you try and establish an infrastructure that will continuously provide for a need that you identify. Mm -hmm. So when we do service learning in our program, our girls' voices into it as much as possible. We ask them to identify a need that they see that needs to be met in their community um, and then come up with a strategy for bringing community awareness to that need. So last year we did something called Photo Voice, which ran over the six weeks. We gave our girls um, cameras that were provided to our program and we asked them to go out in their communities and take pictures of women in non-traditional non roles, wow. right? So we got pictures of women, you know, driving ambulances, women working as police officers and firefighters, and we did a, a photo exhibit at the end of the summer to raise awareness around the community that their, you know, the girls in their community are thinking about these issues. They are interested in seeing more women represented in more roles in their communities. And so they put that out there in their community as sort of a call to action. Um, how do you consider women in your community? What do you think the role is of women and girls in your community? It's fabulous. It's opening so many doors. It's, open, it's just like the mindset is just going to change. You're going to really see a difference there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. And where did this whole program begin? Was this a, a grant program or something you came up with? Or? So uh, Rosie's Girls started by, with the Vermont Works for Women okay, yeah. in Vermont. So they it's sort of a licensure type program. Oh, it's so a they, licensure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They, they started the program, and there's there's Rosie's Girls programs all over the country. Wow. And they all sort of have their own, you know, their own venues, their own you know, ways of doing things. Some are three-week programs. Ours is a six-week program because we're grant-funded, and our grant requires that we run for six weeks. Okay. Um, and we, we sort of take the Rosie's Girls values um, that are given to us through the organization in Vermont yeah. and we apply them to our goals that are related to, you know, the YWCA's values, uh, our grant requirements, and what we see as a need in the girls that we serve. Yeah, sure. And we mix it all together and we create this really yeah. dynamic program. Yeah, it sounds to make a great time. I'd like to visit maybe in the summertime because I heard so much about it working with you, but I'd love to come actually one day and just, just look at it. We'd that, love to have you. Uh, that'd be fantastic. That'd be fantastic. Now, Rady Rosie, is that a little different? Radio, Radio Rosie's, um, yes. Yeah, so that is that is much more um, YW-formed program. It's very, very new. Okay, oh, um, so it's new, okay. Just we had our first, it was grant-funded through the Women's Leadership Council. We got a grant from them, and we were able to do this program twice in the past um, 10 months, I think. We wow. had our first 10-week Radio Rosie's run in the fall of 2014, and we just completed our second nine-week Radio Rosie's program um, in the late winter and, and spring of 2015. And that's centered again at Sophia Academy, and we recruited Sophia Academy students. Some of them were Rosie's Girls. Some of them had never been involved in Rosie's Girls. Mm -hmm. And basically the idea is, um, you know, it's a STEM-based program, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. mathematics. Um, we want our girls working with these, these topics, but we wanted to give them sort of a, you know, a freedom of choice of how they go about working with these topics. So it's a radio-based program. We have this sort of state-of-the-art radio equipment. We give the girls access to that equipment and state-of-the-art radio editing software. We give them access to the software and we just sort of cast a wide net. We say, you know, we want you to create a radio program, an original program, any format you like on a STEM topic. Choose a topic. Wow. And um, we, at the end of our nine weeks of this past um, spring session, we came out the other side with three 
originally produced programs from the six girls who participated this time around. It was we were competing with basketball, so we had oh, um, I get that. <laughs> we we had a low enrollment, but our six girls were very committed and they were present for all nine weeks, which we love to see. Um, and all of them were able to work with their partners to script, pre-produce, record, um, and edit to the to the final edit their original radio podcast on their chosen topic. And that's what we do at Radio Rosie's. What a great learning experience. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, it's a really fun one. I have to listen to the podcast. That's amazing. First of all, I have to get my son Laura to teach me how to get onto a podcast. Then I'll listen. <laughs> okay. I'm th sometimes you mention that information. I'm okay, Mary. I mean, you still got to learn that. Thank God you got kids who can teach you. There's, me. you know, it I should go leave a couple coming. of courses to check that out at Rosie's or Radio Girls. So you are so dedicated, Amy. Every time you talk, you smile. You can tell you love what you do. Um, the girls are certainly great to have you in their lives but where did you begin there's someone in your life when you were a young girl that going back to your childhood that was significant to where you are today um where did I begin well I started working with kids when I was in college actually okay. I um did you go to college I went to college at uh, Marlboro College in Vermont oh, a very yeah. small school yeah. and there's a possibility that maybe one of the people who sees this broadcast will be like oh my gosh Marlboro <laughs> College and so hi um <laughs> In 2005, the first summer after my freshman year, I actually got a job at the daycare that my little sister was attending. Oh, wow. yeah, I have a, a very young sister. She's 13 now, but she was three at the time. Um, and that was my first job with kids. I worked in the toddler room, and I changed, oh, I wow. think, about 1,700 diapers. Yeah, I, I did the I did the math at one point. Um, <laughs> That's good to do. Yeah, and That's I really a step That's yeah. a step project. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. And after that, I spent my summers working at summer camps. Um, and then after I graduated from college, I got into environmental education, oh. which is seasonal. So I, I've worked in a lot of different places. I would kind of go from um, site to site and work for a few months or for a few seasons and then you know go to another one and I eventually came to Rhode Island on that same track I Whoa. was working at Environmental Education Center in South County um, when I came to Rhode Island in 2013. And wh where did you grow up in what state did you? I grew up in Florida actually. Oh, oh my yeah. goodness gracious well yeah well you went from <laughs> sunshine to, to snow. It's true. It's an S word. Yeah. My daughter went to the University of Vermont so I know the snow that's mm -hmm. up there. It's a beautiful beautiful state. It though. is a beautiful really state. Great education too yeah. So Florida to um to Sunshine, it's interesting. I did a, about two years ago almost, I did a um, video on uh, how to toilet train your child. And the videographer said to me, I said, I, go, I have changed thousands and thousands of diapers. And he stopped the video recording. He goes, man, I don't really think you should say that. I go, no, no, 20 years um, in the classroom <laughs> times X amount of toddlers, I should say millions of diapers. Millions of But you maybe, just, yeah. just said in the summer you did 1,700. 1,700, yeah, I, I would not math. even dispute that, trust me. <laughs> I would not dispute that. I totally get that. It goes fast, you know. you gotta you got to change <laughs> at least twice for the shift. There's two changing times, exactly. and then there's all the times in between. So I always uh, do a If I do a training on potty training, which is my, one of my favorite trainings to do is potty training, I was like, I could go in the Guinness Book of Records for changing the most diapers. I just know it, you know. So. Yeah, that's there's an art to that. There's an art to changing diapers. I that's where that. my uh, high-level patience first started yes, to grow. That first that. job with toddlers, you know, they were pre-verbal. Um, they were just starting to walk. They were very needy. And I was 19 years old, and I had a oh. lot to learn about working with kids. And I learned so much that first summer from those, you know, 13 to 23-month-olds. Yes. And it really got me started off on the right track of developing the sort of deep level of patience you need to work with kids of all ages, you know, mm -hmm. whether they're pre-verbal and just starting to walk or they're on their way, mm -hmm. you know, to high school or thinking about college. You're always going to need that depth of patience to really yeah. be present, be able to work closely That's with fantastic. them. That's fantastic. That's a nice way to describe that. And if you can do it with toddlers, you can do it with any anything, Absolutely. anybody or anything at all, any project you want. If you just break yourself down to that level, trust me, everything else goes in, into perspective. Mm -hmm. I get that. I do. So any projects you want to tell me about that Rosie's Girls done that you think you're very proud of or one of, not to name the student, but a student that was kind of like... I Made think uh, one of our major highlights from last summer was um, towards the end of camp, we took a field trip to the Rhode Island Fire Training Academy. Oh, wow. And they were really gracious. Um, they, they weren't training anybody at the time, but they opened up the academy to accept our girls for oh. a day of, of sort of light firefighter training. 
and we spent the day there. Our girls learned so much. Um, you know, we went to the top of the tower and we saw the burn rooms and the burning car and we got to use the fire hose and the girls got to put on the gear and, you know, tr see how far they could run with the several pounds of gear on them. And we did walk away from that day um, with two of our campers saying that they were very sure they wanted to grow up to be firefighters. Wow. Very, we had one fifth grader and I think a seventh grader who were like, this is amazing. I would love to be a firefighter when I grow up. And it was something that, you know, all summer long we're like this is a job you could do this is a job you could do here's a professional to talk to you about this role here's you know some experience to get you you know understanding what it means to do this um, but it wasn't until we went to the fire academy and got really close to the flames that these two girls who were kind of you know over the summer kind of oh, I don't know maybe I want to be a firefighter it seems kind of dangerous there's not a lot of women firefighters going to that academy and getting that hands-on experience and having those instructors take the time to work with them it really helped kind of crystallize for them what it was about firefighting that attracted them and you know it helped them at, even at a young age start to think about Absolutely. what would be required of them to become effective firefighters. I didn't even know we had that in Rhode Island. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a beautiful That's spot. Beautiful. <laughs> it's out in the middle of the woods. It's very hard That's to like get to. Hands on training. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah, and we try and offer our girls as many opportunities to go through, um, you know, get their hands on all these careers that they can. That's it. Get your hands on all the careers that you can. Mm -hmm. so if you think it. You really might want to do it. You need to get involved and you check it out. Absolutely. Absolutely. What, a, what a fantastic. Are you taking like volunteers, anyone to be mentors to um, any of the students? Or oh, yeah. you give up programs to come in and say, I want to teach children, some middle school kids on how to um, weld and do an outreach? Who, who they contact? Absolutely. Someone will be listening to us. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, they can contact the YWCA directly and put them in contact with me or Sophia Academy. YWCA would be best. But we do absolutely look for volunteers for guest speakers people who you know trade instructors oh, somebody wow. who wants to share their skill or have our girls come and do you know a visit on their site um, the first year of the program was involved they did a field trip to um, a stone cutters site and that was a really oh, affecting field trip wow. yeah there's this woman who is a, a stonemason and a stone cutter um, and she kind of had her own you know workshop and she invited our girls out there for that and, and you know the girls love that they absolutely love to connect to these professional women um, and to these these jobs and careers that they've never thought twice about or been given an opportunity to even consider as options for them absolutely I mean I never, I never saw a female bricklayer you know what I mean or someone to build a stone wall you know mm -hmm. so you are really opening up all of those opportunities for girls you're saying whatever you want to be you can be yeah bottom and line bottom line and you know I grew up hearing that whatever you want to be you can wow. be and it so was you know we're home. kind of like coming off you know this like, we're, we're still learning that and it's mm -hmm. it's so vital if we want to be able to fill these jobs that are going to be opening up in the next 10 or 20 years if we're going to be able to meet the demand you know of the next generation of infrastructure building mm -hmm. We need to have all hands on deck, and that means yeah. men and women, boys and girls. Everybody needs to be able to contribute. Everybody needs to be able to have an opportunity to learn the skills that our country and our world needs to continue to develop yeah. in a safe and sustainable way. It's interesting. I met a woman last week when networking, and I said, how did you get in this field? And she went to explain to me the reason she got in this field was um, she wanted to go into social work, and her dad suggested she go into um, nursing. And she goes, I kept saying, I want to be a social worker. And he kept saying, you're going to be a nurse. And it was interesting for me to hear that conversation, that that conversation could still go on in someone's house. I thought that was a 50s conversation. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a 40s conversation. I didn't think in 2000s that you could be still telling your child, you need to be a nurse instead of a social worker. Absolutely. So she went, got a degree in nursing. Interesting, she's telling me, he hated it. And now it's her, she's been in the career of social work for two years, and she's never been as happy. That's wonderful that she, she was, was amazing redirect. That she, but she did listen to her parental piece in the home, which is very interesting to me. And I thought the message still in almost everyone's house was be what you want to be, you can be it. But sometimes that message is still not in that family. And yeah. that's okay. That's their culture. But it's interesting. So i got to give this woman credit. She's in her 40s now. But she's, um, she's following her heart. She's following her heart, mm -hmm. you know. And I think it's so important for any child 
you know, male or female, non-binary, it doesn't matter. Like, children need to be supported and empowered yes. by their parents. Yes. And it's, you know, kind of easy to, like, wag your finger at somebody and be like, that's very gender-biased thinking, but right. it can come really innocently. I, when I was young, when I was 11 years old, I wanted to play football. Yep. Begged my mom to play football. She yep. said, you can play tennis. Football is a boys' sport. I didn't even know at the time, like I know now, that there is a professional women's football league. I don't know. Who know, you know, like so many people today. don't know that. No you idea. know, where did these women come from? They played football. I'm sure wow. they had plenty of people in their lives telling them that, that wasn't an option for them. A lot of these girls, they don't get the exposure to, to know that there, there might be only a few women in this field. Maybe there's not a lot of publicity of women in this field, but you can still go into this you field. You can still go into this field. That's what 2015 we have, have to offer for us, which is fantastic. We've got a few minutes left. Um, do you have a mentor, someone you can um, look up to, look down the whole bit? I've been really fortunate since I've started working with the YWCA. I've worked very closely with um, Deborah Perry oh, Deb again. and Megan Great Grady. Yeah, no, yeah yep. the two of them are, they're so, their, their experiences, I'm leaps and bounds beyond mine and they've been very supportive of yes. me um, from the time you know I originally signed on just for the summer of Rosie's Girls oh, wow. and they were they were so thrilled to have me and, and so supportive of me that you know they wanted to keep me and they signed me on um, full time after the summer and working closely with them I've learned so much and they've connected me to so many really influential women um, really intelligent and just um, you know, really committed women in various fields, you know, all over the state of Rhode Island. Deb Perry's a sharer, she's a networker, and she, she has an eye for hard-working women who can get to the next step. And Meg is, for her age, God bless her, I shouldn't be saying age, but I'm going to say <laughs> it, is so ahead of her time and she doesn't even realize it. She just sees things at such a young professional that she just gets it. She's a very busy woman. Very busy woman. <laughs> she, she's got books all over the place. She, she does, yeah. Hard. Uh, we probably have like another minute and a half left. How do you balance it all? I'm always into balance because I don't know how to do that yet. Um, I'm, I'm a grandmother, so yeah. tell me how to do it. You know, I'm still trying to sort of kick it into high gear, honestly. Okay. You know, I, I see, like, I was, like we were just talking about, Megan and Deb, they're so everywhere. They're so um, busy, and I, I need to kind of push myself a little bit yeah. more before I'm at that level and then I can start thinking about how do I balance it all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah I'll tell you. Uh, I want to see if someone can uh, write a book on balance. However, I did hear something from someone a week ago because I always listen when it comes the wood comes balance. They said balance is a lifetime thing. It begins when you're in your with well, almost like college age, let's say. College age, the time you pass and you might not balance the 20s, but probably in your 60s or 80s, it could be a balance. So you really can't judge balance till you're through the lifespan. And I'm like, but today I'm going to stick with that. It seems right. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because um, it's, it's, especially women, I, I just find, I'm sure for men, but it's a women's show, it's just hard to balance. There's a lot going on in our lives. Absolutely. And you add mothers and all the other pieces to it and aunts. And it's a lot. It's a whole lot, especially if you want to give us back to much of work as it's given to you. We're about ready to end. Any lessons learned you want to pass on to our listening audience? And thank you for listening, absolutely. Um, yeah, I would just say for all the children in your life, um, regardless of gender, support them and their dreams and know that anything that is out there that can be done can be done by anybody. Thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure. Thank Much you, Marianne. Appreciate that.